welcome to a special sort of live edition of the Nexus podcast. This episode was recorded at Black Hat in Las Vegas with Bishop Fox researchers Dan Petro and David Vargas. Dan and David gave a great talk at Black Hat called Badge of Shame, Breaking into Secure Facilities with OSDP. The talk explored vulnerabilities and weaknesses in the OSDP protocol that runs under the hood of many badge readers and controllers that guard secure facilities and office buildings worldwide. These are pretty serious issues and practical attacks that Dan and Dave cover in organizations in critical infrastructure and key industrial installations, for example, should take heed of this research because while OSDP may support encryption and secure communications between readers and controllers. There are serious shortcomings that could be exploited. So now here's my conversation with Dan and Dave of Bishop Fox. Hope you enjoy. Um, so just kind of as like a, a table setter kind of question, give me an indication of where badge readers might be running that support um, this protocol. I know you guys mentioned during the talk, secure facilities. Just talk me through some of the use cases, I guess. Yeah, I can start. So yeah, the any secure facility is likely to have um, many aspects of physical security around um, trying to protect entrances and um, access to specific locations. And a badge reader is going to be part of that setup. So there's going to be you know other physical security mechanisms, cameras, um, maybe even human beings with firearms, depending on the uh, uh, circumstance. And uh, the badge reader is going to be like one of the primary pieces of authentication, uh, specifically for like entry ways, exit ways. Um, and uh, the, these have become ubiquitous around not just high secure facilities, like the sort of place you find in like a military installation or a data center or whatever, but even just ordinary like access to a um, uh, like an office building. Um, sometimes even within uh, specific entryways within an office building. And so the, the badge reader uh, is there to like uh, relay the badge number, the, the thing that is on the physical badge itself that you, the, the employee or individual holds on their person um, out to a back-end controller. And that's kind of where our research picks up. Mm -hmm. And so is this protocol kind of like the de facto protocol in terms of security and encryption? Yeah, so the de facto protocol right now is something called Weekend. Uh, and now that Weekend doesn't actually have any sort of security. So Weekend is all unencrypted, and that's what's mostly deployed. OSDP was meant to be the solution to that. So OSDP, yes, it is meant to be the replacement and offer an encrypted alternative to that. Um, but, you know, as we found out, that wasn't exactly the case. Right. So maybe it'll help the listener to kind of, exp if you could explain what happens when somebody taps their badge on a reader, because I think everybody's kind of familiar with that experience. Yeah, so one of the critical pieces here to understand how badge reader systems work is that the reader, the thing that's in front of you, the thing you tap your badge to, isn't the thing that lets you into the door. Um, it doesn't do any of the authentication or authorization behind the system. All of that uh, occurs on a back-end system that's somewhere inside the building. Um, that is the controller. So the reader is really just kind of relaying this badge number that you present to it out to this back-end controller. And it's that connection that has historically been the source of uh, some uh, uh, problems. So uh, lots of red teaming engagements, the sort of thing that we do at Bishop Fox where we try to break into a secure facility, will involve exactly that attack. So you walk up to a reader, you kind of get a regular Phillips head screwdriver, you unscrew the reader from the wall, insert a listening device to the wires behind the reader, and then put the uh, reader back onto the wall. And then you can intercept all the badge numbers as they go across that bus. And um, uh, given that the uh, the whole point of the door is the, the door and the badge reader sort of circumstances that um, uh, that area is untrusted means that an attacker can get access to that sort of thing. Um, so the pr uh, physically protecting that door isn't always uh, an option. I mean, we have to you know use these sorts of uh, badge reader uh, systems. So Dave, you mentioned the, the Wigan protocol, and obviously OSDP was kind of developed as the secure alternative for that. Um, maybe take me through that and just how this all fits into the motivation for your research. I know it was part of a pen test that you kind of walked into this, right? Sure, yeah. So the idea was actually for it was interesting. Um, so the red team showed up at a secure facility we needed to go in, and we tried the attack with the typical existing tools called an ESP key in this case, inserted it behind the wires. It didn't work. 
um, looked into more and we're like, oh, this facility is running OSDP. And so that's kind of what triggered it. You know, the, the, basically the red team uh, talked to Dan. We're like, you know, nobody's ever looked at this. Maybe, maybe it's something we should be looking at. And so, yeah, that's when it kicked off the whole thing. And so along with the research on all the vulnerabilities that were found, we also needed a way to make it practical and a way to actually use it, right? So to take it from a theoretical point to an actual real vector that we could use. And so that's where the tool development came into place um, to develop that tool. So yeah, uh, now basically there's, there's ways to attack both weekend and OSDP um, to some degree, you know, it's, it's great. So the, and what you discovered was basically plain text data over the wire using your listening device, correct? In some cases, yes. Uh, so that is one of the issues of OSDP. So OSDP doesn't actually require encryption. Encryption was added on as a security extension to it. So the actual protocol, it's it's just, it's unencrypted. Um, there is a difference in how the signals go over the wire, which is why you can't just use an ESP key, um, because basically it uses an underlying layer called RS-485, which also supports multiple buses and, and you know, more, sorry, multiple readers on the same bus. And so the hardware on that ESP key that was existing wasn't enough to intercept this, even though the data is unencrypted in both cases. It's just we needed a way to read differential signals for the OSDP attack. So Yeah, I would say add to that, yeah, the, like, Wiegand is like an analog protocol too. Okay. So it just sends like the raw bits in an analog form that like the badge number is. So a lot of the, the reason that OSDP was created was actually not like security per se. It wasn't necessarily that they wanted to start from the ground up and revamp the security, but just a bunch of functional additions. Mm -hmm. um, you can get better range with RS-485. The multi-drop architecture really helps out. Um, a whole bunch of like having a digital protocol rather than an old like analog one just has a bunch of usability things like you can get better throughput uh, especially if you're trying to do mm -hmm. like uh, biometrics and keypad data and lots of other arbitrary data payloads you want to put on that yeah. bus then like, having a digital uh, protocol is uh, really useful there so the it sort of gives you an idea of, like how this whole thing got started and kind of only realized that security was relevant until like well after it right. had been in development so that's obviously one of the stunning parts of the attack of the of your talk uh, I should say that you know, it's encryption is not required. I mean, did you guys go into this knowing that, or was this like, what, what's going on? No, um, that was that was a surprise to us too. So, um, like, I have a background in cryptographic protocols. It was like a, a, a fun like hobby of mine almost. And so, yeah, we um, uh, wanted to get our hands on one of these OSDP controllers, and so just bought one online off of eBay for like three hundred dollars, and uh, that was like the cheapest one. Says it supports OSDP. Good to go. Get a reader hook it all up, um, plug it in, and then lo and behold, there's the data, just unencrypted. Like, I, like what? Like I, that was not what I was thinking was going to happen. Like, we, it's just not encrypted? Like, and then so, I, you know, looking through the control panel of, the, um, of that particular um, controller, the Axis A1001, um, it quickly became clear that it doesn't even have an option to turn on the encryption. Like, that was stunning, too. Like, what do you mean you can't even turn it on? It's not an option? Like, how weird is that? Um, and that sort of, like, really led us down the rabbit hole of, like, all right, like, what else is there on his, on this? Maybe we can get into it as we go along, but are these configuration issues, implementation issues, or is it the protocol itself that's kind of So lacking? it's a bit of everything. Um, in a lot of cases... An argument can be made that there are configuration issues um, and implementation issues. There is the fundamental flaw with... So there's there's a number of flaws, right? There's uh, things that we call WTFs, uh, which are just not necessarily vulnerabilities or maybe low-level vulnerabilities, um, but they're just surprising to see in a protocol. Things like in a fully secure connection, there's packets that aren't encrypted at all. Like why? What's the point of that? Um, and so... The, the, so there's those two. Now, a fundamental part in actually OSDP is what we call attack number five. The the um, basically it works by intercepting intercepting a default key uh, or taking advantage of how the protocol works. So in order to deliver a base key to the reader from the controller, it must do so via uh, it's got to deliver the key encrypted and how the protocol does that. 
is it encrypts it using a default key. It's symmetric encryption, right? The, the same keys used for encryption and decryption. Now, this default key is known to everybody, so it might as well not be encrypted with this key. It's, it's like plain text, right? right? You can't have encryption with a publicly known key. <laughs> um, and so that, that part is not a misconfiguration. That part is not, uh, you know, it, that, that's a fundamental flaw with the protocol. Yeah. Uh, so an alternate title for our talk might have been, just because you did it on purpose doesn't mean it's not a vulnerability. Um, that often, a lot of the things that we identified weren't like bugs in the traditional sense, as in like you zigged where you should have zagged and, you know, like oopsie daisy, there's a buffer overflow somewhere. It's more like this thing you did on purpose, you should have done the other thing. Um, like, like nobody tripped and fell and accidentally deleted 96 bits of the HMAC, um, as we describe in our talk. Um, like... But that was there on purpose. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it leads to some undesirable consequences. Um, so uh, often the vulnerabilities aren't like, you know, a, a deep in the weeds cryptographic attack. Sometimes they're just a simple reading of the protocol and pointing at it and saying, that's not the way that things should be. Mm -hmm. And I guess to me, too, when I was listening to your talk, it's just one of the key things is that you don't necessarily have to have your listening device on the reader that's protecting the top secret room or whatever it, it, because the, the messages are kind of chained and, and each reader gets the same message, right? Yeah, so uh, RS-45, the underlying protocol beneath uh, OSDP, um, can work in a multi-drop architecture. So that means that uh, on the same bus, on the same physical set of wires, um, you can have multiple readers all in serial um, and then a controller at the end. And they all um, broadcast necessarily all the packets to everybody on the same bus because they're physically on the same literal wire. Right. So just by physics, all of the messages broadcast out to all the devices on the same network. And they're just sort of at the application layer supposed to ignore packets that aren't going to them. Um, but an attacker isn't going to do that, and they're just going to listen to anything. So um, what that means is that if you wanted to get into some door that you really cared about that leads to some top secret location, um, you don't necessarily have to attack that door. You can go to some side door, something that's less interesting, less physically secure, and then insert a listening device there, and it might just be listening for badge numbers throughout the building. Mm -hmm. Can you guys just cover, I know you covered different types of attacks that are possible, uh, replay attacks, downgrade attacks. Maybe you can go into a couple of those, maybe your favorite attack, whatever, but just talk me through a couple of the possible scenarios coming out of this. Sure. So... Um so the keyset command is the, one, the, the, the fundamental one we just talked about. That's my personal favorite because there is no solution to it. That is a flaw in the protocol. Um, another interesting one that I personally like, it's, what, it's a downgrade attack. So because OSDP supports both encrypted and unencrypted traffic, what happens when a reader comes online is the controller asks it for capabilities, right? Because OSDP doesn't only support card data. It also supports keypad data. It supports biometric data. It supports all sorts of different things. So the controller will ask the reader, "Hey, what kind of what what can you uh, what kind of data can you send me?" Um, and amongst the options that the reader replies with, it's a communication security. It tells the controller whether or not it supports encryption. So that's an that's an op interesting opportunity because what we do with our device is we insert it in the wire in the middle of that, and so. When the reply from the reader comes back after the controller asks it, we switch that communication security bit from one saying, yes, I support it, to zero. So now the controller thinks, oh, okay, there's no, you don't support encryption, so let's just move ahead unencrypted. So that's, I think that's another really cool one. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and for, uh, uh, for chicken and egg reasons, you can't encrypt that packet because that's the thing that happens when the controller is saying whether it supports encryption or not. So you obviously can't encrypt that packet. So right. it's one of those like things that happens early on in the communication stream mm -hmm. um, before like you know anything else really gets set up. Um, the I think I would say the, uh, so. The install attack is um, pretty interesting. So the install mode uh, attack is where uh, during initial setup the protocol has this kind of quasi official install mode that readers and controllers can be placed into. And uh, this is fine. You can have this kind of you know, one-time insecure setup uh, process wherein when you're in install mode, um, anyone can just kind of query for the key, for the mm -hmm. encryption key. This is the base key, the thing that is used to derive the session keys, the things that actually encrypt data. And so uh, that part is fine. The problem is that the exact semantics of how 
the install mode is supposed to work is sort of left up to the imagination of the reader. Um, that means necessarily that different implementers are going to implement it differently. And uh, some controllers will just remain persistently in install mode until the admin manually unchecks the like little checkbox right. in their interface to take it out of install mode. And if you fail to do that, then it undermines the security of everything because an attacker could just show up on the bus, query for the uh, encryption key, and the controller will just send it to them, kind of undermining everything. Right. Also, I think it was during the replay attack description you were talking about the data and then the sequence data, mm -hmm. and then the number of bits, and why are we saving bits? Take me through that. Yeah. I, I can't do it justice. Yeah, yeah. so um, there's a number of instances in the protocol where, I, to my best imagining, the reason was that we're, the developers were trying to support low-power devices, things that don't have a lot of horsepower computationally to um, support heavy-duty computation. But anyway, um, it winds up resulting in just um, uh, bits being chopped off of rather important fields, um, the most important which is the HMAC, which is the um, little piece of data at the end of the packet that prevents an attacker from uh, modifying the bits um, that are on the packet itself. It's a key um, hash. Um, normally, this is 128 bits, uses some um, AS. But uh, for uh, reasons unknown, um, 96 of those bits are just thrown away. We just put them in the trash after the computation. Only 32 bits are actually transmitted and checked on the other end. And that's just not enough bits um, to do the things you really need it to do. It starts to really come up to the point of practicality, too, in terms of attack scenarios. Um, if you just do some back of the envelope math of like how many requests do I need to make um, and uh, like how often am I able to make those um, attacks. So like according to our very rough back of the envelope math um, at a reasonably high baud at like 115, uh, 200 baud, it would take something along the order of like a month, like one solid month of continuous attacking at a door, attempting to brute force this HMAC um, off online as it were, uh, to reproduce a badge in request that would succeed to the controller. Um, that has a couple of asterisks next to it in order for that scenario to actually play out. But assuming, you know, uh, the, the scenario plays out like we expect it to, then like one month of continuous attacking should like, you know, scare you. But it's not something that we're likely to actually try at Bishop Fox. We're like, I, I, we aren't going to send David out with like a, 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 a sleeping bag out in front of a building and say like, listen really carefully for a beep. And then once you hear the beep, jump up and run to the door. Cause like, that's just not, you know, something that we're likely to do. Um, but you know, if say the circumstance changes, like what if, uh, you know, we, our S45 can potentially run up to speeds at 10 megabits. Now we're talking mm -hmm. like now suddenly like this is a scary attack. Um, and one could fix this problem pretty easily just by, you know, not throwing away 96 bits of the uh, HMAC. Um, but that would require a breaking change to the protocol that is unlikely to happen soon anyway, um, but um, hopefully will eventually. Right. All right, so tell me, are how practical are these attacks? I mean, do you have to babysit these things in a sleeping bag and, and try it? I mean, walk me through it. No, uh, so that's the cool thing about them. Um, so. W the existing attacks that leverage the current tool called ESP key. So the way it would kind of work is something along these lines. So you show up on site and you need to get the device behind the reader, which is the tricky part. Normally, all it takes is you walk in with a high vis, you know, a vest, maybe a lanyard for the target. And if you want ladder, nobody questions you. You just go behind the reader, pull it out, insert the device. That's it. Now, there's a second part to the device uh, that's an iPhone application that basically interfaces with the device over Bluetooth. So what would happen is we install the device and we go to bed, go to the hotel, whatever, for one night, go back the next day, and now you interface with it. You connect to it. You don't need to move the reader anymore. You just do it over Bluetooth. And now you can pull all the data that is captured over those 24 hours from the device. And now we can replay it. So we can try, depending on, on you know, if there's encryption or HMAX or something set up, we may be able to replay it in one case. So press a button on the app, replay it, open the door, in you go. Um, if, for example, we can't replay it because there's a, an HMAC attached to the, to the packet, well, we still have the car data, so we can use something like a Proxmark to just copy the car data and make ourselves a badge to get in anyway. So th the attacks are pretty practical, which is what's really cool about this. There, there's, you know, it's not a, a theoretical 
Uh, it's not only like Dan saying, we need to brute force 35 days and, and anything like this. No. In some cases, depending on the misconfigurations on it, you can exploit this in like a, a matter of hours. Yeah. So, Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Um, uh, I'd say um, for the first, so we have like five enumerated um, like vulnerabilities basically that our tool will try to exploit. Um, the first um, three slash four of them, you could argue are configuration mis like changes, uh, configuration errors, um, at least things that could be hypothetically fixed via configuration. Um, the last one is not, um, and that's sort of the elephant in the room, which is that OSDB does not have a secure in-band mechanism for key exchange. We just sort of punt it on that problem entirely and just sort of YOLO send the key over to the other end and don't even try to do that in any reasonably secure mechanism, um, which is fine if we're in a scenario, like in a, an attack, uh, like, you know, uh, setup where the one-time insecure setup really can be one time, but it's just not in a physical security perspective because of the fact that an attacker can walk up to the reader and break it. You can just take it off the wall or factory reset it or make it inoperable in one way or another. And then you're left with no other option as an IT team to fix the reader. So walk up to it and take it off the wall and get a new one and reconfigure the reader. So there's always going to be a, a way for an attacker to trigger that one-time insecure setup again. And uh, like trying to solve that problem is hard, mm -hmm. uh, the like key exchange problem, specifically because, one, the attacker has physical access to one of the elements of the attack, um, and also that uh, like these are very disparate um, systems, and so trying – this isn't like HTTPS, where you can do key exchange by hard coding into every device that has ever been made uh, all of the known valid certificate authorities. Um, where that kind of process just wouldn't work here. Right. So, like, one could come up with a scenario to try to fix this that would have, like, X509 certificates that would be made for your organizations. If you're, like, bank.com, you would load into your controller a certificate for bank.com, and you can transmit them to the readers. That way the reader could say, oh, this is from bank.com. The problem there is, though, the readers don't have any kind of input mechanism they don't have like a screen with like buttons on them. That way a tech could go to the reader and say, oh, this is the correct certificate. Press this button, give it the thumbs up, this is the right one. There isn't any good way to do that. You could maybe walk up with a smartphone, like NFC, a lot of the new readers have that functionality. But now we're you know, making things up, waving our hands yeah. and uh, specifying things that aren't going to be in this, the protocol because the protocol is not gonna talk about right. NFC and readers and stuff like that. So. Uh, Purely within the protocol, as like uh, we know it, that's a really hard problem to solve. The key exchange problem. So, is the fix on the affected vendors of the the different readers, or do you have to wait till the protocol gets kind of revamped? Tricky question. Um, so, there are things that manufacturers can do um, to coerce people into using secure setups. So things like um, not supporting on encrypted traffic would be one of them. Things like uh, disabling the uh, install mode, uh, which is one of the settings. Obviously, if we break the reader, they are forced into that, but there is a way to kind of disable it. So there are some things that manufacturers can do to coerce the, the people to stop the attack. But a lot of the problems are with the protocol themselves, like the key exchange that we keep going back to. That's There's short of writing your own kind of key exchange and, and using NFC or out of band or something along those lines, the, there is nothing that, you know, um, yeah, the, that's a protocol specific problem. Okay, so last question, what's the potential victim supposed to do? What are some mitigations, any recommendations from your end? Yeah, so if you are, you know, listening to this um, and uh, wondering, like, what on earth can I do about this at like my facility, right? Um, so certainly there's a few things that are within the purview of configuration. So you know, check the configuration on your end. Unfortunately, there's not like a common nomenclature for some of these. I can't say go to this exact page and make sure there's this setting named right, but uh, basically making sure that your uh, controller that you purchased uh, supports encryption. It might not. 
I purchased the controller on eBay thinking that it would support encryption, and it does not. So uh, I would not fault you if you did the same thing. Uh, so one, making sure that your controller does encryption at all. Um, making sure that it is requiring encryption, that it's like enforcing the use of it. Just because it supports encryption doesn't mean you're actually even using it in practice or an attacker can't downgrade that, right? Um, and also that uh, the install mode um, is disabled on uh, systems that are in production that aren't actively being like in the process of inst installation are things that like you as a, a defender could like reasonably do right now. Mm -hmm. Did you want to no, no, I think they covered all of them. Um, so there is a, uh, a certification, I guess. The So OSDP does have OSDP verified devices, I believe it is, um, which are devices that conform to, uh, that at least support encryption and conform to uh, the best practices, I guess. Um, in our case, when we got the XS8001, I don't believe it's, it's part of that. So... Um, yeah, that, that's one good way to know that at least uh, the reader supports the defense features that we're talking about. Great. All right, guys, congratulations on the work. Excellent job, and uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.